Hello, I'm Brad Lauer, Discipleship Pastor at Campbellsville Baptist Church. It's my honor and privilege to be with you today as we look into God's Word and see what ha He has for us as we try to grow more and more like Him on a daily basis. And so we're going to start a new study, a new series today. Uh, it's on Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. And so we've got a five-week or five-session study we're going to go through on these. And hopefully you will join us for each. You will grab your Bible. You will grab something to write with to take notes or to underline. It's okay to write in your Bible. It's okay to make notes um, because that's what it's for. It's a tool. It's a, it's a resource. It's a guide. And so I hope that you will find time uh, to do this, whether you watch it um, through the television or through our YouTube channel. Either way, I hope that you will find that this is rewarding, informative, but also challenging to who you are and how you grow as a believer. Let's pray and we'll begin. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to come together, whether it's through television or the internet or however we're joined today, that to learn more about who you are, to learn more about your character, to learn more about your desire for us and how you would have us live so that we could be your example and your light and your ambassador in this world today. So guide us today as we look into this study, as we start this study, as we begin a journey together. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Beatitudes. So we're going to look at um, five different sessions um, over the next so many weeks and, and just look at the Beatitudes in a little more detail and how they are to be interpreted and how, to be, how they are to address our lives and change us each and every day. And so first, I want to do a little background information uh, items about Matthew itself, an overview of Matthew, because Matthew was the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Remember, God had been silent for about 400 years before Matthew was written, well, before the birth of Jesus. And so there was about a 400-year gap in between the last voice of God talking to His people and today, and that was uh, a span of you know, for a long time, 400 years. Um, and Matthew helps to illustrate and to lay out the fulfillment of the prophecies from the Old Testament about who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who Jesus will become. It was written from a Jewish perspective. Um, it was to fulfill the law as, as seen by fulfilling the laws of the prophet or fulfilling the prophecies in the Old Testament. It was written from a Jewish perspective, so it would keep to the law. Um, has as many as 61 direct quotes from the Old Testament within the pages of Matthew, and that's twice as many as any other of the Gospels. Matthew or Levi, I mean, he was called both, um, was the writer of such a book. It was the second gospel written. Mark was the first. Matthew was the second. And it was written around 60 A.D. after Jesus had died and gone to heaven, been raised from the dead, gone to heaven, back to be with the Father. So, he, he, so Matthew put these thoughts together later. There's not a chrono, it's not a chronological book, but a witness to Jesus' mission and His message. In other words, if you compare it with the other gospels, sometimes they're out of order so it's not per day or per year or per month of his life, and it wasn't a connected journey, but it was the story of Jesus about his mission and about his message. It, Jesus is the promised Messiah and the long-awaited king of Israel, but Jesus is also the Messiah, Messiah king of heaven. The kingdom of God in, in Matthew said five times, but the kingdom of heaven phrase is used 32 times. There's a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt that says, happiness is not a goal. It's a byproduct. Happiness is rooted in external circumstances. Okay? Joy is rooted in our relationship with Christ. So happiness is not a goal. It's a byproduct. And so we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. And it has the phrase in it, blessed. Blessed are. Happy are. But it's deeper meaning than, than happy. Because happiness is such an emotional-based emotion. Or joy. Or blessed, the deep concerning character of God is deeper than that. 
And so the Sermon on the Mount, it's, we have this concept of religion. They had the concept of religion in that day and time that this was written, that religion was a system of burdensome rules and regulations. Think about it in the Old Testament. We've got the Ten Commandments. And then they expanded on the Ten Commandments in the book of Numbers, in the book of Leviticus, and in the book of Deuteronomy about all the different laws that we have for life. That God gave many of these laws. A lot of these laws have been expanded upon. And so there's 800 and something laws. And so the people saw that, that, that religion was this list of do's and don'ts this list of unrealistic things to, to keep up with and to watch every step along your way instead of living a life, focusing on Christ. And religious leaders were very legalistic. And we find that in the church today. We find that in some perceptions that we have today in the church about um, you have to do things a certain way. You have to dress a certain way. You have to have a hairstyle a certain way. You have to sing a certain way. You have to have certain instrumentation. You have to... Uh, live a certain way, the do's and don'ts of life. And so the religious leaders, not only were they legalistic, they were also seen as uh, hypocritical. And that's one of the criticisms, even of the church today, that it, the building is full of hypocrites because they say one thing and do another. No believer is perfect. That's our desire and our strive. But however, and we make choices every day, but at the same time, that, that's kind of an overview um, religion at this time became lifeless and ceremonial dutiful observance of laws and rituals but Jesus is trying to bring a refreshing change he, he wants to bring faithful sincere obedience where we have a choice he wants to focus back on the true message of the Old Testament he always the way we describe it, many teachers and, and preachers have described what Jesus was doing was the intent of the law, not the legalistic letter of the law, the intent of the law, the heartfelt obedience. These were promises of blessing that we're getting ready to go through in the Beatitudes for those who exhibited Jesus' character. And so what Jesus is calling us to do and what every believer is called to do is to take on the characteristics of Christ. And so the Beatitudes are just those. They're characteristics of Christ. They are not just that, but they are also part of the discipleship process. If you look at them as building blocks of your faith, one at a time, one on top of the other, you can't move too quickly through them. You can't jump around because these are a systematic way, from my perspective, a systematic way to grow in your faith and to become more and more like Christ. And so... Let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And then we'll come back and, pick it and, and go through it verse by verse. But let's just read an overview as we begin. Now, starting chapter 5, verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And so he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So let's look at a couple things. One, Jesus sat down, took the posture of, of a teacher. He had compassion. Jesus was, in other words, the new Moses of the time. Moses was seen as a great leader, teacher, um, who brought freedom to a group of people, and that's who Jesus is, the new Moses. So he had compassion. He took the position of a teacher. He sat down among his people and talked to them. And 
scholars will, will vary on their perception of this, but Jesus didn't stand up with a microphone and a pulpit during that time. He sat down and talked to his teacher, to his students that were around him, and then they turned around and told others. And so the gathering of the Sermon on the Mount, though there may have been thousands of people there, Jesus still sat down in an elevated state so more people could hear him, but it had to be echoed throughout throughout the people. And that's why he talked in short segments and themes that were short so that that story could be told and repeated, kind of like a ripple effect down the mountain, since it was considered a sermon on the mount. It's a collection of sermons, could be, but we're going to take them as a whole. And so um, Jesus was here to fill a void in people's lives. These are the people who typically follow Jesus. They're physically sick, emotionally unstable, financially destitute, uneducated and illiterate. Some are religiously influential and politically powerful. And the, the theme here is Jesus was different. Jesus was not like the typical prophet or the typical religious leaders of the day. Love drew people to him. He had this unconditional love and presence about him. And we see it from the flip side. We see it through a rearview mirror, looking back over the pages of the Bible of who Jesus was. And we know more today because we have the, we have the gift of distance. We have the gift of history. We have the gift of scriptures being written. They were living in the midst of at that moment. So there was something about Jesus that was different. It was his personality. It was the way people were drawn to him because of love. He taught on his own authority. He didn't teach on the authority of anyone else. Emphasized the reality of, of a loving God who was ready to forgive sin. Not confront with judgment of sin like Moses and the other religious leaders of that day. Grace and mercy, and love, not judgment and wrath and punishment. Now, let me stop there before we go farther. doesn't say that there's not consequences to our sins. doesn't say that there's consequences to the choice we make, that it's a life or death decision if we follow Christ or not. But it's how we interact with people. We don't point out faults, but love them through our differences. So let's go on. So the Beatitudes, let's think about this. He said, he didn't say, hey, think about this. He didn't say, it didn't say, give this some little thought. He was teaching directly to his students. In other words, the Beatitudes are not multiple choice. Let's pick one or pick another, or maybe we'll pick two out of the 10 or eight, or we'll pick four or five and follow those. Kind of like the 10 commandments are not multiple choice. They're not options. They are commandments. There are 10 of them. We're to follow all 10, not just the ones that make us feel good or the ones that are easy. This, the, the Beatitudes, like I said, are a building block for our faith, the discipleship process. We cannot pick and choose which fruits of the Spirit we will adopt nor select, which Beatitude we will ask God to help us and help develop in our lives. We have to take them as a whole Describing the way God's people must live if they expect Christ to be seen in them. What makes us different? What makes a Christian different than someone who does not believe in Christ? should be the way they live, the way they love, the way they give grace, the way they give mercy, the way they treat people. Even the pagans, it says in Scripture, do some of these things. Even the pagans give to the poor and the destitute and the needy. Even the poor are nice at times. So what makes us different? It is by our love. It is by our love. So let's begin. Blessed, happiness. It's not an emotional response. During this time, happiness and following God were not connected because of judgment. You could not be a happy person. You could not be full of joy and follow God because the rules were so restrictive. So Jesus is trying to change the concept. And he's also trying to say the fact that God is always with us in love and grace. We don't have to go visit him somewhere else. He is with us continually. So there's a systematic order in the eight traits of a citizen of heaven. And that's what we're talking about. As Christians, as someone who follows Christ, who's a Christ follower, we become citizens of heaven. And it says that. It says we are not 
we are not of this world. We are not citizens in this world. We are aliens. Our citizenship is in heaven. Um, the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are totally who are in need are in total need of God. In other words, the down and out, the destitute, you are in the gutter, basically, in life. I'm not saying physically in life you're not in the gutter. You may be someone who is well off, well to do. Doesn't mean that you're not destitute. Doesn't mean that you're not poor in spirit means you have no relationship with God. And you've come to an understanding that you're nothing apart from a relationship through Jesus Christ with God the Father. And what happens when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and enter into that relationship with God and become a child of God? There's a reward. Each of these have a reward. For, it says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is salvation. Second one. Blessed are those who mourn. For they. For they will be comforted. Mourning. In that day and time, there were professional mourners who weeped and wailed at funerals outside of people's homes when somebody died or was deathly sick. But he's talking about a mourn that comes from deep because what they do is they see the world through the eyes of Christ. You see the hurt. You see the sadness. You see the tragedy. You see the failure throughout, throughout the world. And you want to do something about it. And you may even see it in your own life. And so for the reward is that true sorrow of our sins leads to repentance, which brings comfort of God's grace and forgiveness in our lives, and we extend that to those in, in the lives that we meet. So blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who look at the world and see the world and even see their own lives through the lens of what Christ sees us, a hurting, dying, sorrowful, frightened people but the reward is when we see that and we come to grips with that and we have that relationship with Jesus Christ we see the world through that as a characteristic we see ourselves through that so that we understand it and then we help them see hope in Jesus Christ and so the reward is true sorrow of, for our sins leads to repentance which brings comfort of God's grace and forgiveness to each person blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, or meekness, gentleness, not weakness, not in a sense of because you're meek, you're a doormat, but someone who is of great meekness. And there were two in the Bible. One was Jesus, of course, because he took on all these characteristics. The other person that was considered meek was Moses. Not weakness, but humility and trust in God instead of self-centeredness and I believe you and I can agree that we live in a world full of self-centeredness it's a all for me type of culture how can I succeed how can I get ahead how can I get ahead of someone else how can I be better off how can I instead of looking at the whole and so the reward for someone who is this is they can they get a new heaven and they get a new earth and then we move on to the next one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be fit. Bleh, for they shall be, or they will be filled. Have you been hungry in your life? Have you really been hungry? Where you, have you been thirsty? If you want to experience that real quickly, I can give you a quick illustration how to do it. Go get 10 saltine crackers and eat those and then drink nothing for an hour. You will experience a, a thirst because everything dries up in your mouth. Now, that's not true thirsting and that's not true hunger. We think we're hungry. I have a 17-year-old son um, 
soon to be 18, who I can't fill him up. He's always hungry, but he's not really hungry. He's just a little bit uncomfortable because the amount of food he eats in a day can never be quantified that he ever goes hungry. But you have this genuine thing. You hunger and you thirst after God means when you're, when you're hungry, if you think it, you can humor me for a moment, when you're hungry or really thirsty, the only thing you think about during those times is food and water or food and drink. When you come in out of a hard day of work, you're out, maybe you've been outside, you sweated or you've worked out and you're just parched and you're thirsty. All you can think about is getting something to drink or if you've just not eaten for a long time and all of a sudden you realize you're hungry, all you do is think about, okay, what can I eat? Where can I go? And so many of us, though we may not be hungry, I think most of us eat out of boredom. I do. We stand at the refrigerator and look. If we're hungry enough, we'll eat anything in there. But if we're not really hungry, we go, yeah, I don't really see anything I like and shut the door. We go to the, the pantry and do the same thing. So it's not really that we're hungry. But to truly hunger and thirst after things of God means that our reward is genuine satisfaction and fulfillment. When we focus on the things of God, when we focus on the Word of God, when we focus on the reality of who God is in our lives and who He wants us to be and how He wants to work through us, and then we see those things happen. And that becomes our passion and our desire. And everything we think about is how can I hunger and thirst more after God? Just like we want to hunger and thirst after a, a cheeseburger. Then that, if that's all we're thinking about, who God is and God's righteousness, we will be filled in a way that we can never, never explain. Blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy. Someone who's merciful, generous, they're compassionate, they have forgiveness. They're, it's part of God's nature to show mercy, to extend mercy. They have a spiritual gifts inventory. Many, many of you may or may not have taken it. I don't know. But one of the spiritual gifts is mercy. This is an area I have to work on. It's one of the lower ones. I have my spiritual gifts are something different. Um, but mercy is one that we're all given and we all have to use it on some level and to be more like Christ we have to show it more and more because we have to be able to extend the same thing that we were given we were given unconditional love and forgiveness so we have to show that to others we have to be able to extend unconditional love we have to be able to extend mercy forgiveness love encouragement and that's the reward we we will be able to show others we've been forgiven and we can then now forgive when we understand that blessed are the pure in heart for they will see god it's one of my favorite ones pure in heart what that means as i've studied and looked at it is a single-minded devotion to god it's kind of the fruition and the finished product of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, now we have purity of heart because God has so invaded everything about us that that is the filter of our lives. And we become pure in heart, single-minded devotion to God, total awareness of needing God in everything we do and every part of who we are. The reward is to see God and experience intimate fellowship with him maybe not that personal one-on-one -on -one look in God's eyes all the time but it is a deep deep intimate relationship and fellowship with God blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God peacemakers state of wholeness and completeness in all areas of life and we know people like that who have, you know, peacemakers. They understand and see from a different perspective. They have a state of wholeness and completeness in all areas of life, God and others. And the reward is when we strive to make peace doing work of God, we will be called children of God. Now, everything we do and are called to do by God is not necessarily peaceful to this culture. Because God's ways, God's truths, 
God's laws are different than what our culture teaches. They're different than what way an, un, an unbelieving world operates. But when we strive to make peace, doing the work of God, we will be called children of God. Which leads to the next thing that becomes very, very difficult for us to understand. But because when we do these things, when we get to this peacemaker stage, this is what's going to happen next. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because of the truth of God. Blessed are those who are because they live for Christ each and every day. And everything they do points people to Christ, they will be persecuted because of Christ. And we're persecuted in so many ways as believers. We're persecuted, maybe not physically, or maybe we are. Maybe we're persecuted emotionally. Maybe we don't get that promotion. Maybe we don't get that loan. Maybe we don't get that advancement. Maybe we don't get um, a status that we think we deserve or Sometimes we just have bad days and bad things happen. But because we're living for Christ, we're going to be persecuted in some way, shape, form, or another. But our reward is simple. Our reward is heaven. Because we, are, we will continue, Blessed are you when your people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice! Rejoice in this. Understand this. Be glad. Because great is reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who are before you. Take comfort in knowing you're not alone in this journey. Take comfort in knowing that others have gone through this as well. But take comfort in knowing that our reward, our ultimate goal, and our ultimate citizenship, and our ultimate place of being, it's in heaven with God. On the mountain, Moses went up to talk with God. Jesus went up to teach, but to bring also a different meaning of the mountain. Mountains, uh, Moses' mountain meant law and judgment. Jesus' mountain meant relationship, mercy, forgiveness, love, the characteristics of Jesus, the characteristics of God. Jesus took each characteristic and gave it new meaning. Poor, mourning, meek, hunger and thirst, seen as good characteristics, not negative. Mercy, pure in heart, peacemakers, as growth characteristics. Persecuted, the real reason. Who is our battle with? It is not with flesh and blood, but with powers above, powers around. In verse 3 and 10, For the kingdom of heaven is theirs, not the Romans and not the Jews, but God's children. So blessed or happy is rooted in the future, not in the here and now. Kingdom people and worldly people, people are opposites. These are characteristics which are building blocks for our lives. God, we thank you for today and this moment that we've had together to share in your scripture, and look at the building blocks of our faith and see that they go together. They're not isolated, but they're a growing process in our lives. And that these things are going to happen, but you have rewritten the rules and the story because of your love and your grace and your mercy. So no longer do mountains represent judgment, but they represent grace and mercy and growth in you. And so God, as we close our time together, may we Remember you in all things. May we go to you in all things. May we give you praise and glory in all things. And may we trust you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with me today. I hope that you have been blessed and challenged by God's Word. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to come and ask me or call me. Uh, you, my, you can call the church office at 270-465-8115. Ask for me or you can go to email me at bradl at cvelbaptist.com. I'd love to talk to you about God's Word or about any other things in your life that you feel like you need someone to talk to. Come join us for worship every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And then we stay in groups after that in what we call Sunday school or small group Bible study. We'd love to have you be a part. Please come check us out. 
We'll talk to you soon. And may God always guide your steps and guide your path.